I'm Mike Spratt. I'm one of the owners and founders of Destiny Bay. It's winter now and we're halfway through our pruning. This is my favorite time of the year. Crisp air, early shadows, the silence broken by the snipping of shears. One vintage ends and another vintage begins. Over two decades ago, my wife Anne and I retired from our fast-paced careers in California and moved to New Zealand to relax. We decided to start a small family vineyard to keep ourselves active. All we really wanted to do was make a wine we were proud to serve to our friends. Now, 20 years later, we find ourselves producing one of the top Cabernet blends in the world. So how did we go from a small family adventure to making a wine that rivals the French First Growths, Italian Super Tuscans, and Californian Australian Colt Cabs. It started off so simple. Grow some grapes, make some wine, have some fun. Somewhere along the way, things just got completely out of control. I guess that's what happens when you forget to leave your ambitions behind and they collide with inspiration and an enchanted place. But what makes this story even more improbable is the location. New Zealand is known for making world-class Sauvignon Blanc and distinctive Pinot Noirs, but Cabernet blends, not so much. It takes a unique combination of soil, site, climate, and some magic to grow these varieties. So how do we do it? I'm gonna let you in on our secrets, but I need you to play an important role. I want you to pretend that you're a bunch of grapes at Destiny Bay. Your amazing journey begins in this vineyard, a tiny amphitheater-shaped valley that faces north. Why is that so important? Well, to make world-class wine, we need ripe fruit. Ripe fruit has just the right amount of sugar and concentrated varietal flavors. Sugar increases with heat, but flavor depends on letting the grapes linger on the vine. Hang time is critical to ripen all the compounds that produce aroma, mouthfeel, structure, and body. The challenge now facing winemakers around the world is how to get fruit ripe while coping with climate change. It is getting hotter and hotter in the late summer and early fall. Sugar levels go up so high and so fast that winemakers must harvest fruit before the flavor compounds have matured. Otherwise, they risk making unbalanced, high alcohol wine. This brings us to one of our most important advantages. While we can trap and reflect heat unlike anywhere else, Waiheke Island and our vineyard also benefits from a unique set of geographic conditions. When the large landmass of central Waikato to the southeast of the vineyard heats up in the late summer, it causes the air to warm and rise. The biggest low-lying waterway feeding central Waikato is the Firth of Thames, and Waiheke Island sits right at the entrance. In other words, Waiheke is in the middle of Mother Nature's biggest air conditioning duct. The hotter it gets, the more the AC turns up. Never too hot, never too cold. By the time harvest day comes, your grapes have just the right amount of sugar, concentrated varietal flavors, and structure all polished off with smooth and silky tannins. In a word, you are perfect. It's graduation day in the vineyard. Only a special few will travel the final leg of this journey, and you are one of those lucky bunches. Early in the morning, you are cut from your vine and placed in a bin. Your short ride from the steep vineyard to the winery is on the back of a six-wheel drive, all-terrain vehicle. A forklift places your bin on a loading table, and you are slowly fed into the distemmer. A large cylinder with holes in it and paddles rotating around a shaft. Centrifugal force and friction separates berries from your stem and they fall through the holes while the stems are pushed out a chute. Normally, the berries would drop into a crusher, get squashed, end up in a hopper, and then they would be sucked into the winery through a hose. But that's not good enough for you. 
Instead, your berries fall onto a big vibrating table with a grate on it. As the berries bounce across, any small bits of stem or undeveloped fruit falls through the grate, leaving only ripe whole berries to move forward. Many producers skip this step. They claim it's not a problem because the amount of material that falls through the grate is typically only two to three percent of the total volume. And they are correct, but that two to three percent is very potent and can taint the wine. Consider this example. You are cooking a big pot of sauce in your kitchen. Guests are over, the TV is on. You are all drinking wine and you're not paying close enough attention. You accidentally add two tablespoons of chili powder instead of two teaspoons. Do you think anybody's gonna notice the difference? Even though it is only a tiny amount, it can have a major impact. That is why we don't want that harsh berry material in the tank with the wine. The fruit that falls off the vibrating table looks pretty clean, but this is still not good enough. As your berries travel down the conveyor, people sitting on both sides pick out any remaining bits before they fall into a crusher that just splits the berries open before an auger gently pushes the fruit inside the winery into a tank. This is what happens to every grape, every year, no exception. If you make it into my winery, you are very, very special. The first thing that happens in the winery is we cool the tank so that we can begin extracting some of the water-soluble compounds in your seeds and skin. After a couple of days, when the tank warms up, we add yeast and fermentation begins. The yeast consumes the sugar, produces heat, alcohol, and carbon dioxide. This pushes the seeds and skin to the top of the tank, forming a cap. Because we want to keep the seeds and skin in contact with the juice, we have to manage the process around the clock by periodically pumping juice from the bottom of the tank over the top and plunging the cap down into the juice. Once all the sugar has been converted to alcohol, usually after about 10 days, the yeast dies and settles to the bottom of the tank. Within a few days, the cap sinks. At this point, others would be keen to get the wine out of the tank to reduce exposure to the substandard berry material or chili powder they didn't remove. But there isn't any in your tank. So instead of pressing off the wine, we seal the tank and let you soak for another three to six weeks. This extended maceration enables us to extract every bit of flavor from your berries. When the wine is ready for pressing, we drain all the free run juice directly into French and American oak barrels. And then we move the tank down to the press room to extract the remaining 30%. The first step is a gentle squeeze. Most of the press wine comes from this first fraction. The process is repeated two more times. When finished, we have separated all the wine from your berries into free run and three press fractions. While most producers consider free run to be the gold juice, because your fruit is so clean and ripe, these deep press fractions are actually the platinum juice. After all the wine is in barrel, it is time for a rest. Any sediment from the fermentation and pressing process settles to the bottom of each barrel. After a few months, we slowly draw the wine out of a barrel and put it into a clean barrel, leaving the sediment behind. Since we typically produce 10 fermentation batches, we have 40 distinct components rather than just five grape varieties. The winemaking team spends a day tasting each of these components, agreeing on the characteristics, and then allocating them to the three blends. 
Magnum Premia is a traditional left bank Bordeaux style blend dominated by Cabernet Sauvignon. Destiné is a right bank style reflecting a balance between Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. And Miste fits between the two. Now consider what this means for the wine from your grapes. Some of your wine goes into Magna Premia, some into Miste, and some into Destiné. So a little bit of you is in every single bottle of that vintage. We let the wine age for another nine to 12 months before it is bottled. After bottling, the wine is aged another two years or more before it is labeled, packaged, and shipped to our patrons and trade partners around the world. And that is how you go from a special bunch of grapes to a bottle of Destiny Bay wine. I hope you enjoyed your journey through our vineyard and winery. You should feel very proud of yourself. Only a few special grapes make it into a glass of Destiny Bay wine. In a few more weeks, the long winter hibernation will end. All around us, tiny buds will push from these tethered canes and a new vintage journey will begin. <laughs>